The Franchise Factor with Paul Waite and Andras Tassi on Aspen Waite Radio. And this is Paul Waite, joined as always by my good friend, Mr. Andras Tassi. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, Paul. A, a very warm goulash welcome from Hungary. <laughs> it is. So this is The Franchise Factor. We've um, we had a bit of a break because um, Andras has been... Summer, that's what it is. Everybody is on summer. That's holiday. what it is. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's much better than I was going to say. So we had a bit of a break, but uh, we're going to be back bigger than ever. And um, we're really building something special for the future, aren't we? So you just wait to next year, you people. So today we're going to talk about all things international, aren't we? It will be, yeah. We're talking about the franchise businesses, how they can grow their business uh, internationally. And yes, I think the next few months will get a lot of amazing expert in light for us. And there are beautiful things what we will introduce for this show. So I, I can't wait to introduce all those new guests what we will have. Uh, even end of September and October, going to be really excited. So for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Paul Waite. I am officially a chartered accountant with an honours degree in economics. And um, I've worked for two of the biggest firms of accountants in the world, particularly good at um, helping businesses to grow, including Mr. Talzies. And... Uh, I've, I've probably had uh, as wide a range of business experience as a human being can possibly have, fulfilled every single board position other than that, a sales director, actually. So I've been chairman, chief executive, finance director, marketing director, commercial director uh, in, in my time, company secretary, obviously. Um, been uh, chief executive of uh, an innovation company that was listed. And um, I was very fortunate to meet Mr. Tarzi about three years ago, mm -hmm. introduced, and um, I've sort of become sort of your mentor and I'm also a small shareholder and uh, we provide some professional services uh, to SMD. Um, Andras is, um, was already an entrepreneur in his own country of Hungary. Yeah, I'm an entrepreneur for like 26 years now, unbelievably, even if I'm, I'm just 43. But yeah. Yeah, he still looks like a baby. So um, between the two of us, we have um, an unusual wealth of uh, experience. And I think the other thing as well is um, we're both very entrepreneurial and uh, and risk taking, but not to the point of stupidity. Uh, so Are you sure in that. <laughs> Sometimes I, think, I feel. <laughs> I think the one thing that I can promise you, listeners, is that uh, you'll be listening to two people who have uh, encountered every potential problem you encounter. We know what it's like to be you, um, and and we still want to be so. Uh, we're very much, uh, very much joined forces at the moment with a view to uh, creating greatly significant added value to the SMD group and also to the Aspen Weight proposition. So uh, we hope to use our experience in the weeks and years to come uh, to help all you people become even more successful than you would be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm actually the founder of the company called SMD. And SMD is a digital marketing company and our main um, goal is to help franchise businesses to grow on multiple locations. And I think doing that so now we get involved in a lot of franchise uh, businesses helping to over 500 franchise businesses to run their uh, social media really? and marketing. Oh, yeah, it's 550 something. I and should they, know. Are these all UK companies? Or? <laughs> no, this is global in 35 countries altogether. Yeah. 35? 35 countries now. Yeah. Uh, what's the sort of weirdest country or the most... You know. I think I think that the country where I enjoy the most the communication is so diverse. Div Singapore, I really really like those meetings and and, and that's that's they're a nice and people there. They're really nice people, yeah. really chill, really nice, and and I really like those meetings. It's really interesting to have meetings all over the world, and sometimes one of my meetings is at night time, and just an hour later it's, it's a morning meeting somewhere else in a, in another country. So yeah, it's it's really interesting. But that's why we will talk about today um, internationalization of franchise businesses. We will have a guest today, uh, Belinda, who is from Runo Franchising, and she's one of the directors there, and she has an amazing knowledge and 20 years of experience on how you can uh, extend your franchise business overseas and how you should deal with the uh, different uh, aspects of your franchise when you're going international. So I guess um, the first question to ask you is for the for the – for the premise of this show today, are we assuming that the uh, the target person already has a UK franchise? Uh, UK or global, as you know, we be extending now the show as well. But yes, but most of the of the listeners would be from UK at the moment. So when we talk about launching a franchise internationally, that also could be 
someone in Singapore opening in UK or, 100%, or in the and Netherlands or, or Copenhagen or something. A, a lot of businesses looking at the UK as a good opportunity at the moment. And if you go for these franchise shows and you have a look, amazing amount of um, international businesses are actually coming to try to extend their place. And these franchise shows are normally to find those first master franchise locations so then you can start a business. But they many making a huge mistake when they didn't do their research. And that's what we will discuss today, what you need to make sure that that you do before you do any franchising in multiple countries. Okay, so setting the scene, we, we're, we're talking about a, a franchise that is, is set up in its home country, probably, whether that be um, the UK or Singapore or Hungary, and we're looking to move into multi-locations globally, one or more. So um, where do we start then, Andras? What's the first thing we do? Well, the first thing what you will do is is definitely the research, and then you need to do your 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 you built your company in that that country. You 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 tried tested your franchise business, and you grow it where you are. But every single country, different countries have this, different cultures and rules as well. So I think what we need to discuss today, and what we will go through, is what are those rules, or how you how you need to what you need to make sure to actually check. And we will learn a lot from Belinda uh, in this journey. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and I guess, yeah, a, a, a point that um, I find quite interesting, actually, I have, especially on social media, I interact with people from quite a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find um, quite often you have significant cultural differences. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the actual business concepts are relatively, you know, accepted and standard, but uh, the way that people think and the way they go about things can be quite different. So, um uh, I, I notice you talk about something called cultural adaptation. Um, so how important is that and what does it really mean? Well, in, in this particular case, when we're looking at that, it's, it's really simple to, 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 to find out a couple of things about these businesses. The first thing what I would say is just if you just think about the basics that how people actually do business in certain countries. Some countries, are like US, for example, they will all do digital for many, many years now. So it's very simple for them to, to get in uh, on online and just without face-to-face -face meetings. But in UK, still networking and networking events are really, really big. So there are a lot of things what you need to uh, consider before before you you go uh, overseas. So I, I think if we, if we um, um, think through the journey, and if we discuss every aspect, if you research it wisely, then you will be in a better position to to get your franchise overseas. <laughs> so, oh, address is muttering at me there, so <laughs> I don't know whether he thinks I'm a, a mind reader. So um, I think we should have a music break at this point. Uh, so as well as um, giving you lots of great practical advice about how to take your franchise into uh, into, into other other territories. Um, of course, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that Aspen Way is a, radio, a music radio station bringing you the best music across the world, we like to think. And next we have um, a track from the Beatles, a bit of a heavier one, that's uh, Revolution. It's a track from The Who, Substitute. I actually bought that single when I was um, a wee lad. Anyway, welcome back to The Franchise Factor with Paul and Andras. So um, we're talking about um, uh, an existing franchise business that's looking to... Uh, move to a new location globally. And while I was listening to the music just then, a, a rather fundamental point rather hit me, Andras, which is mm. um, you wouldn't want to be expanding off the back of um, an inefficient operation in itself, would you? That's definitely. Yes, you, you need to have a really efficient operation before you extend. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So how, how do people know when they're ready to, uh, to, to, to to expand globally? And what are the benefits of that, I guess? Well, obviously, you need to see that in, in the country where you are, how, how you manage to adopt that country and how big you are. And obviously, you need a, a strong finance uh, situation as well. But one thing what you definitely need to check is what are the uh, legal and regulational um, requirements as well, because maybe in your country you already had that done, but every country is different. And then different countries have, will have different laws and regulations, especially when it's come to franchising. It's vital to ensure that uh, the legal requirements are met before you, you're launching it. And how much experience do you have with that yourself? 
on the legal field, not too much. I'm not not really in a in a in a legal field or or getting in, but we do have a lot of people we're working with when franchises need help, and we can we can offer and and then give that support support from third parties. I mean, just for uh, sharing, this is a a first disclosure to Andras. Uh, the only legal system that I'm I, I working knowledge with, other than the English one, is called the Napoleonic Code, mm. uh, which was obviously French. But for instance, Polish law is enshrined in the Napoleonic Code. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, those uh, I I I I think you know I did a huge amount of work in Poland um, quite early on in the life of Aspen Weight, actually. Um, I've also um, done quite a lot of business in Thailand uh, where I had to get immersed in tax accounting business and legals. Um, yeah, I think I think for the most part, um, most countries, I, I, in, in, well, I was very lucky because um, I worked for, um, one, one, the company I worked for second in my career was a company called Ernst & Young, who uh, obviously are a global force. And because... I've I've managed never to leave anywhere, you know, other than as a friend. Uh, I'm I've always been very good at like phoning up Ernst and Young in Warsaw, for instance, and mm-hmm. and saying hi. I used to work for Ernst and Young in Exeter. Um, can I come and see you next week when I'm in Warsaw? And um, and getting hours of free advice <laughs> in whatever foreign city I happen to be in, you know. Mm. So. I think having a, a, a local foreign advisor is obviously extremely important. And, um, and of course, you know, you, if you think about something like a food franchise, you could, you could be into a disaster if you didn't fully understand the, Absolutely. the, um, the environmental and food laws in a particular country. That could be... But it's the same with like education and uh, sexual health sexual sector. That they, they have some really strong laws, what we need to be really careful to know about. But I think yeah, this is this is the, the the main point is that every single country will have that. And for example, in uh, in uh, in the UK, there are no regulations for franchise businesses. In a sense, there are business regulations, but it's an, a kind of an un- unregulated uh, territory. So it's really important to to know that where you're going is how strict those rules are, and you can you can end up with with big issues. And yes, as you said, local uh, search for the local support to find out. So I guess, you know, what we're saying today is that um, um, it's very important that if you're looking to expand, that uh, you understand the culture and the regulations and the law of of the country you're moving into. But also, I think it's extremely important you do your market research first to make sure that, that country is the right one for you to go into. Absolutely right. And that there could be could be really... I mean, you, you're extending your business. You need to make sure that your brand is... Is, is fit to that market because quite often even a name of your brand is is unpronounceable or or something what people will not understand or or the culture is not uh, the same in that that was a, a really good example of that I'm not going to name the the multi uh, locational um, coffee chain but they are one of the biggest probably the biggest on a, on a, on, a, on earth and they wanted to move to Australia. And even a company with that money, they didn't do the thorough research for Australia. And they bumped into the situation where Australians didn't want it to go with a big brand. They really wanted their local shops. So they was really connected for those local coffee shops. Oh, okay. And they failed uh, first. They needed five years to research and learn how they could go back to that country and extend it. And now they have successfully growing in that country. But first, the first of them cost them a lot of money. They went in and people just didn't want them to be there. Okay, so... Um we sort of dipped our toe in the water about legal and regulatory compliance. So I guess the next um, significant thing to talk about would be support and training for the international franchisees. What have we got to say about that then? Great, great point, Paul. Providing um, support and training for international franchises is crucial. Uh, this will ensure that you understand the brand values, operations, and standards. And you discussed that. It's actually, one of the questions where you ask how important that you actually have your operations and standards set it up already. And then you need to make sure that you actually have a system to train that out for those locations. And it's obviously really important to have the uh, language of, uh, so speak. So you need to have either someone in your team, if you are comfortable with that, to talk the, the, the language of that country, or use um, um, a more universal language like English. 
and most of the franchise businesses will have that decision and they're usually doing their trainings and supports in english language yeah, it's interesting isn't it so um if you take france for instance as a as a good sounding point uh the french have actually i don't know if you know this the french government has actually passed legislation uh which has been done protectively to defend their language mm. uh, because obviously english is a uh, universal language with a ever expanding vocabulary. You know, this I don't know, there's something like a thousand new words enter the dictionary every year or something. Um, especially when you get social media stuff and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I, I remember um, picking up a consultancy assignment in Paris soon after I formed Aspen Weight. And um, on the Sunday morning, I walked into a McDonald's in Paris. Mm. And of course, with them, it's Le Big Mac. Mm. Le Big so that's Mac. that's the uh, that's the uh, uh, that's basically McDonald's reacting to the French wanting to be more proud of their language. Whereas uh, maybe in Hungary, maybe or certainly um, you know, let's take the Scandinavian countries. You know, if you listen to to most Norwegian athletes, for instance, they they speak as good English as an English person Absolute does. Perfect. You know? So you know, if you walked into Oslo Mac McDonald's, I, I would imagine that it just says Big Mac, quarter pounder, you know, so on and so well, forth. So now they're using the the Mac Royal, you know, <laughs> the Royal Royal instead of quarter pounder. But yeah, well, no, not really. I, like I would say, Hungary, Romania, these regions are really behind on language learning at the moment, especially I have if it's in English. In by the way. Oh, you see, yeah, of course, yeah, that's yeah. It. is that is that. Oh, I remember <laughs> when they opened the first one back in the um, end of eighties. Uh, but yeah, language is, it could be a barrier. But as I said, most of the franchise businesses is making sure that they try to find partners who actually speak um, the same language. So um, sort of moving on relevantly in terms of, you know, what you need to get sorted out when you when you are expanding internationally. I suppose we should think about uh, logistics and supply because, um, you know, depending on obviously what sort of franchise you've got, you certainly wouldn't want to be McDonald's and, and not have a, a regular supply of meat, for instance, would you? That would be rather foolish. So um, it's, it's very important that um, the franchisee ensures that products and services uh, are delivered efficiently and consistent, consistently across borders. And this is a, a huge challenge. Um, I think it's true that nearly all really successful franchisees, it, the whole point is it doesn't make any difference where you are. So the McDonald's... Yep. The, the burger in space is the same as it does yeah. in Mexico City, uh, as it does in London, for instance. So logistics and supply is therefore a huge issue, isn't it? Just very interestingly, just uh, to this point, uh, there are some small changes sometimes. And I just read an article about, uh, we just mentioned McDonald's, we will do again. Uh, but in, in Hungary, McDonald's actually changed the recipe, uh, recipe of the food to fit more for the country. And it's really rare. Normally, they start to stick, start to stick to that. Sometimes the difference would be with how much how much salt you're using in your food and small small little things. And because, as you said, they want to be the same taste everywhere, but occasionally they do. I got, just got one. It's, it's always good to tell relevant things. So, um, I was very um, fortunate to be invited to Ulitsa uh, Chocolatova. Uh, mm. in Warsaw mm. uh, as the guest of the chief executive of Cadbury's in Poland. And um, he informed me that the Polish Cadbury's had 47% more sugar in exactly. it than, than <laughs> British chocolate, for instance. Yeah, well, I, I think most of the things in the US are really, really sweet and, and, and very sugary as well. You see, it's the taste of, and this is cultural differences, and you need to make sure that you understand those. Uh, to to do that, but one thing what is what is probably even more important is communication. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have a setup when you can regularly communicate with your international franchisees and help and address their concerns, sharing the practice. And I think the here I'm, I'm always saying that the best and the and the and the, the best working um, franchises, the franchises who grow the, the the most, usually the headquarter always keeping. Um, a franchisee for themselves, like a test site, and they're still running the franchisee operation as well, in a sense, so they can learn from that, and then it's a lot easier for them to understand those local issues and what, what's happening on the local markets. However, 
if you don't, if, and if, if you want to learn more, then you need to communicate with those locations and find out. And those people are, are bringing you great value to give you the, the advice, what they think and how those things work. And this is where uh, always in a franchising world, there's a big debate, you know, that there is a system what works. We have the head office, we, we created this brand, we understand, but then these franchisees they do know a lot about their location and those locations will bring you a lot of value and a lot of information regarding the the audience and it's especially when it's an international brand it could 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 be the 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 making and breaking point sorry if this is a bit of an ignorant point but again something's just hit me uh one of the things i try to do on the show is obviously you know i'm i'm basically the um the foil to the rapier of andras mm -hmm. uh so I, I just try and sort of sit there and and think about if i was a listener mm. what what sort of questions would i want to ask so a very a very relevant question just plopped into my head are we talking i i had made an assumption rightly or wrongly um when we started to show that we were talking about people that had a franchise in the country and those people were in themselves going to open a franchise somewhere else then it occurred to me that may not actually be what happens. It might simply, it might be that uh, you're actually looking for a franchisee. So you're becoming, you're a franchisee in your country. You're then looking to establish a franchise model in another country. So is which of the two is more relevant here? The more relevant is that the franchise who build this whole system and got the system in place, they're reaching out and usually they try to find a master franchise, a business owner who maybe don't even have experience on franchise business. Sometimes those people don't even have experience in the type of the franchise that they're looking for. So someone without an experience or education or franchise can still buy a franchise if they have relevant skills like sales and marketing. So what you need to do as a, as a master franchise, find what are the most important things for your franchise to be maybe you don't, you want someone with a with a, a large experience in in retail or large experience in a food and restaurant uh, world or maybe you want someone who know how to sell because then you need to be the one who finding the business owners who want to open franchisees and this is like a chain of of a franchising model you know head office master franchise on a location who know the market better than you will work with you to grow that business in that country there we have it, folks. Uh, taking your franchise business um, into an international location is a is an exciting venture, but it also comes with huge challenges. It's obviously very important that you make sure you have the infrastructure and support in your head office uh, to support those uh, those new businesses. Um, but with the right planning, research, and support, it it can be the right thing to do, and indeed, even a game changer. It is a game changer. Uh, currently, we're temporarily leaving the world of the international franchise, mm -hmm. and we're going into an area that um, I think we're both expert at, but maybe from slightly different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much self-taught, so it's very much a case of, let's see what that does, and if I do that, you know, what reaction am I going to have, and so on and so forth over over many years. So, of course, we're, we're talking about probably the least understood, but I think the most important part of a business – and that's marketing and sales. Mm, absolutely, Paul. And especially in a franchising world, a lot of businesses will be will have a good setup for marketing, and they will uh, lose all those leads and and uh, and the success from the marketing because of the sales and the other way around as well. The marketing is not strong enough; so you just don't don't get enough uh, leads. You can sell, so it needs to be the right balance as well. And this is really hard, especially in a in a um, a space when you usually dealing with both sides of the businesses. So uh, when we talk about franchise businesses, it's a business to business and a business to customer as well. Because when you're selling your franchise, where you try to find your master franchises, you try to find your franchise locations, you're selling as a business to a business minded person to sell your franchise, but then they need to be there for their customers and sell to the customers. So there are two big aspects here. And obviously, you can sell before people know about you. So this is why marketing is is really important in this uh, sense. I can see that you got some opinions on that. So. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking there. Cause it, it wouldn't be something I could say in a, say out loud on the radio. It was, it was when you said that people would have to know about it before you could sell something. I was thinking of some obvious exceptions to that rule. But there we are. I will leave that for your mind. Um, so um, marketing. So Marketing is uh, something, as I say, I think marketing is uh, by far the most least understood uh, part of a business. Uh, people 
people don't really know what it is. Uh, they they have unrealistic expectations of it. Uh, I I have, for for better or worse, I think uh, the maker sort of made me uh, as a marketing person, and I I sort of instinctively know what to do about things that people otherwise wouldn't. You know, I, I find that with people who don't understand marketing, it can be very frustrating because those people have so they're not they're not able to do anything creative themselves. But what they can do is criticise you. Mm. Uh, and what I find commonly is that people expect marketing initiatives to turn into gold very quickly. But, of course, you you and I well know that sometimes um, you can carry out a marketing initiative which might take years mm. for you to actually um, financially benefit from, from that. Also, you can market for reasons other than just purely revenue. Um, it can be market positioning, um, making it. I remember, for instance, once um, I had a phone call. Uh, I think it was on a Thursday or Friday, uh, one or two days before Wales were playing, I think it was New Zealand at the Millennium Stadium. And this person basically phoned up and said, we've been let down. It was by one of the big 10 firms of accountants, actually. Um, and we have, uh, I think it was a £9,000 piece of advertising you know, in the ground where where you get the thing goes all the mm. way around. So you're talking here about five, six meters, you know, electronic Bonus, going around. Yeah. Uh, and I managed to get it for two grand mm. from ten, <laughs> right? And um, and and I did that purely because I want. It was me saying, "Aspen waiter here." Mm. You know what I mean? There's nothing more than that. It was, "I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. We're here." It wasn't to get revenue or anything. You know what I mean? So there, there are lots of reasons why you know you might market something. So, of course, you know, marketing in itself. Where does it start with? Well, you know, so as you as you very wisely said, um, you can't really sell something unless you know what you're selling. And very, very helpful if you have a brand. So, um, marketing is about uh, building a brand. Uh, then things, something I'm really, really mustered on. Uh, I think. Brand consistency, not deviating mm. off brand delivery or message, uh, or all those sort of things. I think the the power of images um, and the power of creating impact um, should should not be underestimated. Uh, often, this involves this whole process involves uh, a tremendous amount of market research and um, an engagement with with the wider customer base. Mm. Absolutely right, and I think I'm simplifying. The franchising word I know, but really, the franchise is a brand, and the the strongest thing what a franchise would have is a brand, and this is why that consistency is extremely important, and this is why when you're growing your franchise brand, you really early need to uh, measure and research: is it working? Are my brand, are my logos, are my colors are right for my audience? Because if not, when you extend, it will be just harder and harder to change that brand. And we've seen that before with many, many brands. Even the, even the big ones who we mentioned a couple of times already, McDonald's would tweak and change their brand constantly uh, because the trends are changing as well. But the core colors, the core branding is always the same because they need to keep that consistency up. And and this is why um, the, the, the whole marketing, starting with the research and understanding your audience who then you will sell. So the big old question, what is more important, the marketing or the sales? Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, I, I, I would I, say I, they're I, equally I, important. If you had, if you, if, if you had, I think if I was, if I was pushed, I'd have to say sales was. Mm, yeah, well, it's really hard. He'd be a very poor businessman if you just had superb, <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've actually got, you know, I don't, I don't mind talking about my own problems on air. Um, we've got a situation in Aspen Way where we have the most magnificent environmental product called Legacy, uh, which my brother is the mansion director of. And I, we, I did have a bit of an argument with him last week because I basically accused him of letting the, the product drift. Mm. And he got quite aerated with me and he said he wasn't letting it drift. And I actually said to him, I know what you're going to say. I said, you're going to tell me that you've been consistently building up uh, the, the product range. Well, when I was talking to my father at the weekend about it, I said, we're like a vegetable shop, fruit and veg shop that already has 20 products. 
And instead of my brother selling them, he's gone and bought another 20. <laughs> so now we've got 40 products we haven't sold. So that's my clumsy way of, of saying how important selling is. So at the end of the day, what we've managed to do is we've created a business which is fantastic, in my opinion, operationally fantastic, but it has no market delivery. So I think on balance, you'd have to go for... Um, and of course, yeah, there, there are many instances of people who've managed to very successfully sell off the back of no brand. That's absolutely right. But if, if I need to point out one of these uh, from franchising perspective and our own experience is that the, one of the first questions, if not the first question, what I'm asking when we, we start to work with the franchise business is what is your conversion rate? How many of your leads you can convert? Because we know that we're doing a good job and bringing in those leads. But if this, this, there is no salesperson or good sales strategy to sell it, it's not going to work. So I, I, it's really hard to find out what is more important. But I would say that you need to have your conversion rates up. You need to know how to sell your brand before you market. You need to understand what is your brand. So the marketing part is more of a building the brand. But before you start to go out and reach millions, you need to make sure that you can actually sell your product. Yeah, so I'm um, picking up off a memo I saw you write the other day. Um, so I think this is the correct answer, actually. Actually, uh, marketing and sales need to be in sync. Brilliant marketing on its own is clearly pointless because you just end up spending lots of money with no revenue. Uh, of the two, I would say as a, as a pure businessman, um, you could cope with having some revenue and no brand better than having a great brand and, and no revenue. But uh, I think that the, the, the real secret is is to have them in sync. With great marketing, it becomes obviously much easier to sell. And I think it's, you know, that's all, that's all we can say, isn't it? Probably so. that's the goal. That's the goal. Try to get your marketing on a level that your sales team has just to ask if they want to pay. Yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately, it's I suppose it's it's how one goes about um, fusing the, the marketing and, and, and sales effort. And, and how one evolves over time. We take McDonald's, for instance. Uh, I was thinking this just now when I was listening to you. Uh, so when I first started going to McDonald's, and I think about you know going to McDonald's when my children were were younger. Um, if you think about, uh, I like banana milkshakes. You know, terrible thing to admit to, but <laughs> absolutely, it's actually one of my favourite drinks of the world. Uh, absolutely oh, love banana. For me too. This I love banana milkshake. Uh, and um, if you go back twenty years ago. McDonald's milkshakes were made out of chicken fat. Mm. Absolutely disgusting. If you saw, you know, and of course, McDonald's themselves were an ecological and environmental disaster, weren't they? And of course, what, and there was quite a lot of um, negative publicity mm. towards them. And of course, what McDonald's have done now is sort of try to reinvent themselves as this sort of positive green force, haven't they? Yeah, Somehow or other, the food is good for you, even though it looks very not good it for you. It started with that movie, isn't it? The Super Size Me. That was the big, big uh, uh, trigger for them. So, um, yeah, so I think, that's, I think that's, I can't think of anything more to say about sales and marketing at this point. So, Well, there are a lot of things to talk about, and especially in the franchising. But I think what we need to uh, make sure, when you have a franchise business, one thing what you need to make sure is that you not just get the system, what is your marketing and your documentation ready, not just the sales systems and SOPs, but you are ready to train that down to your franchisees and especially for your man master franchisees as well, especially if you go international. And our guest today is Belinda. Belinda is from Runo Franchising and she got 20 year, years of experience of international franchising and she's, she will uh, share a lot of valuable in, information regarding. Good morning, Belinda, and welcome back to the Franchise Factor. Today we have a guest, um, Belinda, uh, who is an accomplished executive for 30 years of experience in franchising sector. And I would like to ask her to introduce herself to our audience today. Thank you very much, Andres, um, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, 
I um, I've been in the franchise sector for some 30 years, as you've said. I originally started my career in in South Africa in 1991, and I've had the privilege of working with some of the great minds who've created some very very successful networks. I've also had the privilege of creating my own and expanding networks across borders. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a, a wonderful experience, and it's um it's it's a pleasure to be able to share that and that knowledge and that experience with people who are wanting to do similar things. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Then you are now part of Bruno Franchising as well. So can you start to giving us a brief overview of Bruno Franchising, uh, Bruno Franchising and its main areas of focus? Sure. Um, Runo Franchising is a specialist franchising firm, um, three main directors, and we're about to appoint our fourth director. Um, and we concentrate our efforts on consulting. So that's business modeling and looking at businesses that want to create, um, use franchising as a, as a medium to expand. Um, we also are very involved in the recruitment of franchisees, both locally and internationally. And that would be franchisees for franchisors and also looking for master franchisees for those franchisors who are wanting to expand internationally. We're also very heavily involved in training and um, both Julie and I have a very um, strong training background. Um, uh, our, we have developed training programs for the franchise sector here in the UK as well as in South Africa. Um, they are accredited, they um, are, are very unique in, in that they address, they address the the hardcore facts about franchising um, from from certainly from our perspective. Um, they're online as well, and we'll be soon, very soon developing those um, further. And then we're also involved in business migration. So those business, so those people wanting to come into different countries, enter different countries using business migration visas, um, and franchising is a perfect uh, tool for that, um, and assisting them in making the right decisions about which franchises to choose, to invest in, um, so that they can make those 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 choices from an informed perspective so that's what runo does that's brilliant well it's and it's not a big secret that my company smd and runo got a close relationship and we're working together yes. for for many many i would say we know each other for many years now and meeting at every single part and finally we're working together in a deep relationship Indeed. and i can say that runo franchising is an amazing company to work with and i'm really really happy that we met and we started to work together uh but how did you get involved with runo franchising in the first place what was your journey been like well, I um I moved to the UK from South Africa about seven years ago, and I worked for a multi-national um, global um, franchise firm at the time, um, and I worked with Runo from a training perspective. So we we use their training material to to train our franchisees both locally and internationally. Um, I met up with Julie and um, and Tony at the time, and uh, and when I, when I it came to making different decisions about where I wanted to be in the in my future. Uh, it seemed like a logical move to to join the two of them. They we had a plan to create a consulting firm that made a difference. Uh, that we you know looked at um, our values, uh, what was important in the market space. You know the UK is not a regulated market space, and so anything kind of goes in franchising. And we're, we we we'd seen that, and we wanted to make a difference by. Um, contributing positively using our experience to make a difference um, and to guide and and mentor future franchisors um, to assist franchisees coming into the space by assisting them to ask the right questions to do their homework their due diligence on 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 buying a franchise and then also importantly we wanted to contribute positively by developing the training programs which which we have made a start on and so uh, it was a it was a meeting of minds um, collectively we have more than 80 years of experience in the franchise sector between us we all get on extremely well um, and it seemed like a logical next step to to to, to make, um, and so it wasn't a terribly difficult decision. Um, and we we decided at the end of 2022, sort of second half of 2022, that we should formalise these plans and get cracking, and that's exactly what we did. 
I think this is brilliant, and especially when things go tough, and at the moment the market is tough. Being an an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur minded person, it's always hard just to run a business and focus on that. And if you have someone who you can share the workload, you get someone who you can you can discuss and main and and brainstorm. Especially if it's in, in a director level, that's always helping you go through. I'm lucky to have a a brilliant partner in your business, Norbert, and I really really think yes. that that's that's our strength is working together. It's really really helping the business to grow as well but can you sure. um, elaborate on on your current role and what exactly your part and primary responsibilities in in runo franchising yes um so i'm primarily involved in the consulting side and the business modeling side and the expansion of networks internationally um that's not to say i don't do anything else of course i do um but my my efforts are concentrated on working with businesses who um, have a desire to franchise to create a franchise model um and so we take them through a process usually takes between eight and 12 months depending on the, on how the how evolved the business is and the availability of time that the owner has to to devote to it um and so i work very closely with my colleague tony and we and we work we coach mentor and package franchise or businesses as franchises um i'm also very involved in taking businesses internationally so those that want to expand um there is a bit of a process there and having done it myself i have come across the pitfalls um i've, w- I've worked through those um those stumbling blocks um and what you think is just a simple process i'll just find a master and I, all will be well in the world is not quite like that um and so i as i said having done it myself a couple of times over in in territory vast territories from the first world to the third world um there are some challenges and um and we assist a franchisors in, in that in that process in 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 making that leap into foreign waters that's absolutely brilliant i i feel that you you almost already answered the next question by just uh, telling that that the the huge share of experience what you as a team uh director team have in a in a company and it's really interesting to hear how how that combination of knowledge could be an extreme benefit for someone who would work with runo franchising but just to summarize that in your thoughts on what you really think about it how does runo franchising description uh, how, how you are different from your other franchising or other franchising consultancies I think our, our, our value add is that we've done it before. So we haven't just worked for people who've done this and watched it from afar. We've actually felt the pain. We've invested money. We've, um, you know, the tires hit the tar, so to speak. Um, and we we have direct experience in that. So when it comes to building a franchise model, when it comes to being a franchisee, when it comes to learning that process we have been there it's not as though we learned it from somebody else and i think there is a very very big difference from having worked for a firm that happened to be in the franchise sector and actually having done it yourself and i i'm very grateful for the experiences i've had i've um i've, I've been privileged to work with some very big firms i've been privileged enough to have been invested in um and and have taken brands uh, from nothing to a franchise model and then expanded them internationally and I've done that all practically um and applied that knowledge myself figured it out myself um and so first hand I know what that takes so I can I can it, I resonate with other franchisors who are in the same boat uh, a little bit fearful not quite sure um is this all a theory or have you actually had some some practical experience behind you and and i think that's what we bring to the party is that practical knowledge and knowing on the ground that this theory is simply not going to work for a number of reasons or perhaps it will so that's what we bring to the party and and the fact that we work from a value set so we are selecting our clients we don't just take on anybody um we look for like-minded people we look for people who are genuine and serious about developing sustainable replicatable businesses um rather than just developing a big get rich quick scheme um that is certainly not um our Uh, ethos and it's not what we aspire to do and we walk away from that kind of deal if so to speak and and likewise in our recruitment space you know we don't we don't take on recruitment clients who don't care about their franchisees who don't have a support system who 
um, cannot walk the walk. You know, they've got to they've got to be able to do that. And having been in the, the sector for a long time, and and Tony and I and and Julie having worked in in such various sectors as as you know the food and beverage sector, food and drink, pubs, restaurants, oil industry, child education, B two B, B two C, health and wellness, um, to name but a few. We've worked in all of those sectors, and you're looking for slightly different qualities and people and you're looking for unique selling points in businesses when it comes to replicating them and and so we've seen what works we've seen what doesn't work and and that's what we are able to share with our client base and um and and, and it's that valuable experience that enables them to make informed decisions about how they do things um and i think that's that's different to a lot of consultants who've simply it's just a job Absolutely right, and this is this is really the truth. I'm I'm as you know in a, in a franchising market for quite a while, while now, and one thing what I found, what you just said that experiencing is such a different that I found that most of the top um um successful franchise businesses franchisors will still have at least one like demo site or they kept one of the franchisees from themselves to run by themselves doesn't matter what the size of the franchise is just because that experience experiencing on every single level is so important and therefore someone who coming from a space when you being the franchise or the franchisee and all the levels that experience is changing the the way how you can teach that how you can mentor people and how you actually understand because it's, that's that's the hard part. Understand how the franchise word works because it's really unique and it's absolutely brilliant with all the, all of the challenges that they have. That's brilliant. I would like okay. to speak a little bit about um, internationally how how franchises can grow internationally. And now my first question would be to you, Belinda, from your experience, what are the top three reasons businesses decide to take their franchises internationally? Well, I think uh, I think the obvious one is that they want to expand their footprint. They want to expand their network, and when they feel they've got a good grip on the, the existing territory, the exi existing country they're in, it, it is a logical move to want to expand from there. And if you're in a country like the UK and you are exhibiting at shows and what have you, then you know there are a lot of international visitors that come and are interested, and so you get a lot of requests for this. So I think it's a logical next move to want to expand their footprint. Of course, the, the obvious is increasing their revenue base because as you expand, of course, that's the, the next the next um, positive that comes from it but I also think for discerning franchisors it's about learning to improve their existing business model and challenging it in new sectors and you can't really do that unless you unless you take that leap and go and and operate in another mm. territory with, with slightly different dynamics involved and and that all goes to improve and enhance and support the existing business model which which I think is very important so those would be my top three Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, but when they're doing it, what are the common misconceptions uh, businesses have about extending their franchise to international markets? What would be in your The opinion? common ones really, um, Andres, are they, they completely underestimate the effect of local culture and behavior. So, you know, a lot of franchisors run the risk and and make the mistake of being so in love with their own concept that they believe everybody will be in love with that concept and uh, and on the ground locally culturally um, uh, people's behaviors are very different and I think the, the underestimating that I also think underestimating the power of local brands so entering a new market um, doesn't mean that what you're doing has never been done before. Sure, it might have, it might be done slightly differently, but there are some local brands and, and in certain territories, those are well established. And I think the, you know, underestimate, especially when, when franchisors move from sort of first world countries into emerging markets. That's a, that's a mistake that is often made. Um, and then underestimating the financial implications of that expansion. So there's often this thought that, well, you know, I'll simply sell a master franchise and I'll use that money to, to sort of support the effort. Um, very often calculations are not made about what it will cost. Um, as I said, all the implications are misunderstood. Um, um, and and so um, you know you 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 end up taking on masters. You're unprepared to to support 
and uh, and what is starts to emerge in terms of the requirements to establish in that country you know gets all a little bit blurred and 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 that's when it starts to get a bit wobbly in the beginning so yeah that's uh, those are those are some of the common the common mistakes that are made believing that a, a master franchisor will do all the work and you just have to sit back and and uh, you know you'll just provide your manuals and you'll just provide some some training but they've got to sort of adapt it um as a franchise or you're a custodian support. of your brand, you have to position it. Um, and, and there's a certain amount of responsibility and investment that's required from the franchise or's part as well. Without mentioning a, a, a brand name, I, I, I can, I, that is one of the, I can just say that one of the biggest cafe chains um, ever wanted to go to Australia and they got yes. all the money where you can, you can imagine and they failed to extend in, in, in a country because even a big company like them with thousands of locations they underestimated exactly what you said all those local coffee shops were so popular so strong and even they brought in this brick band and everything is is so true and the culture was different and they didn't understand it they needed another step it took them five years to literally learn and relaunch the company now a little bit more successfully but that's what you just said is absolutely true and i i i, I you can we can see that where the, your expert is coming from um so sure. but but can can you just uh, walk us through on an initial steps for business should take uh, before they actually consider to go to international expansion? You mentioned a couple of things, just a, just mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit more structure for that. Sure, I think I would always uh, my advice to anyone wanting to expand is it's it's a very great and noble idea, but I would always start country by country with a strategic brand alignment plan and assessment. So go in there on the ground and. Uh, and figure out some basics uh, about your brand. How's it going to be positioned in the market space? What is the territory divide going to look like? Um, can you simply adopt the same assumptions you made in, in, in segmenting territories in your existing country? Can that be adopted or does it need to be adapted in the new country? Um, I would certainly look at brand positioning in that new country, uh, what, who are your competitors and don't discount the locals because that is the, that, that is a big mistake that's often made. Um, currency fluctuations are massive when entering into the emerging oh, markets yeah. and, um, and the return on investment that you think you're going to make may not be there. Um, you know, dealing with central banks and getting money in and out of countries, you need to understand the mechanics of that and the legal ramifications of it. Understanding franchise law in that space, uh, it's franchising is regulated in a lot of countries. It's not in the UK. And so UK based firms expanding internationally have not often had to deal with that kind of regulation. And so adaptations need to be made as far as that's concerned. And then general things like just your brand uh, and the naming of your brand is that even pronounceable in the new language in the new country that you're oh, going yeah. in it, how will it be interpreted you know um and it, is it even is it vaguely similar to anything else you know there are those kinds of practical mm. things we don't think about you know often when i'm dealing with franchise or, or with business owners who want to franchise one of the first things i'll say is begin with the end in mind is this a franchise that is simply always going to remain local or at some point in the future do you see yourself going international with this brand does it have legs to be able to do that because if it does you need to think now about about your logo about your brand about your naming conventions because that is something that's difficult it's not impossible but it's difficult to change once you've got 30 or 40 franchisees behind you to suddenly have to change the name because it's not going to be understood in a new country is is not a change you really want mm. to make and you find that also in the foreign territories wanting to come into the uk so um brands from france for example or brands from italy brands from spain um or south america you know and some of the african countries as well wanting or asian countries wanting to come into the the UK and they've got very very specific language that's used in their branding and in their naming convention and that's often difficult to adapt you know bringing that into the into the British market it may well be misunderstood completely you know and um, and not and, and and not appreciated and certainly locally it may not even be able to be pronounced so mm. that that becomes 
quite difficult. So all of those things we cover in a in a in a sort of a strategic brand alignment assessment. And you know, it's something. It's it, yes, to a large extent, it's a desktop assessment. But we spend four to six weeks investigating all of those options and putting together a sort of pros and cons. Is this going to work? What adaptations do we need to make? And then financially, what could we charge? What it does. Uh, if the brand is a services brand, what what are the related brands in that country doing doing similar things, and how does your pricing brand band work? And then how much can you can you sell your franchise for in that country? You know, you might get fifty thousand pounds for a franchise in the UK. Try taking that to Morocco; it's not going to work at that at that price band. You know, probably. So it's one of those things that you have to have to look at. And see whether there is a viable return on investment. So um, those those financial calculations are very important before entering the market. Wow, that's that's uh, thank you very much. Amazing insights there. Uh, definitely useful. So um, you already mentioned the cultural uh, adaptation. To be honest, on on both topics, but um, what what play into the strategy and introduction of franchise in a new country? How does cultural adaptation should be, uh, in your opinion? Well, it's it's massive. It, it it's a it's make huge. or break um op- uh, uh, aspect actually because you know customer buying habits um of 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 different in different places. Um, I I can tell you from personal experience taking a expanding a, a big leisure brand into certain European countries where um you know they had the luxury of being able to be open all day and into the evening in some of the western countries um and in some of the european countries were not able to open during the day because customers simply weren't going to support them during the day the climate didn't didn't um support that the customer buying habits didn't support that and so uh, a brand that that could operate for 10 hours a day suddenly could only operate for six hours a day. And that has massive financial implications. So understanding that alone, um, and the and and you, you need to be on the ground, you need to deal with the locals to understand that, you know, um, in certain sectors, you you have to take these into consideration, these these buying habits and the and and how the local culture operates. Yeah. That's brilliant. And and obviously you mentioned that as well, but what are the legal and financial considerations what the business should uh, be prepared when they're extending. Sure. Um, yes. Uh, hugely different in different countries. As I said, franchise franchise law is um, regulated in certain countries. There's often the need in those countries to disclose. So disclosure documents or finan- uh, franchise information memorandums, as we know them in the UK, firms um, become re- a requirement. There's often um, they are often very uh, specific about what you must disclose. So things like how many stores have you closed? What were the names and uh, contact details of those franchisees that close stores sometimes is a requirement that you have to disclose. Um, certainly your financial information and your forecasts need to need to have come from actual um, figures and not just not just projections. Um, so that there's a need often around that. Um, yeah, so from from a legal perspective, you know, franchise uh, lawyers, solicitors um, on the ground in that country um, are often the first port of call that I go to in terms of just in, uh, making sure that that your agreement is aligned. Very often, you know, contract law is what what underpins all UK franchises, and you can pretty much put whatever you like in your contract so long as it's vaguely fair and reasonable. Um, and that's and and that in some cases is very vague um, in, in terms of interpretation. But in some countries, uh, there are obligations on the sides of franchise also know and understand what those are before you enter those territories. Um, and then financially, what is it going to cost? Um, what is it going to cost if you've got if you've got a product based franchise to get your product from the UK into that market? What are exchange controls? What do those look like? What are duties looking like there? Um, is there going to be some some sort of you know um, great import tax that's suddenly going to be on you know imposed on you? Um, and is that going to affect what you can charge for a product? You know, do you? Do you, there's a lot, there's a lot of investment from a from from a financial point of view that you need to be prepared for. You know, are you going to run a holding company in that country or are you not? Um, how are you going to get your royalties out of that country? <laughs> how are you going to get receive your payments from that country? Um, and what to what extent will the exchange rate um, affect your own projections and your own return on investment? So 
a number of calculations have to be made. Absolutely brilliant, Melinda. As, as I need to mention here, the Runo franchising is one of the businesses who, who who I know that they will always support and help businesses, and they are there if you need any help. So there are a lot of beautiful information already in this uh, in this interview. If you need anything, if you got any questions, please just ask, send us a, a message, a comment, an email uh, on the radio site or just reach out to Bruno, Bruno Franchising uh, on their page because they they will tell, they are there for you for for help. So thank you very much, Bendy. I will I will now move to to more of for like uh, challenges and key consideration. I'm I'm really checking the time as well because I can see that we can talk about this a lot. Uh, so so let's just let's just jump to the next next question and that would be. Um, because what we just and how we just discussed, I think it's really important to have your your master franchisees and your franchisees uh, uh, as the best as you can uh, to choose. So how important to find uh, your local partnerships or finding the right franchisee in international extension journey? Hugely important because that is, uh, you know, the extension of your brand. Uh, they need to absolutely buy into the brand they need they your brand ambassadors they need to be well resourced financially um because there's a lot of adaptation that needs to happen on the ground they need to build teams of people a, a master franchisor's business and a franchisee's business are two totally different business models and very often they have to establish both so they have to establish their own french a franchise model um, to act as the, as the pilot in that country and they have to establish a franchise or team around them so there's two businesses that need establishing um, and that takes resource um, there's a while before you see any return on that investment um, and so you need somebody who's got a very good strong business background um, who understands franchising um, um, and who's prepared to be trained by you um, in all the elements of the brand so that they're able to replicate that successfully in the new country. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say is, is, is hugely. I was a little internet glitch there uh, for a second. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. That's yeah. brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, well, thank you. Well, obviously, SMD, um, not just a digital marketing company, we are a technology provider, so I couldn't resist and I have to ask you, as we do uh, uh, provide a social media marketing tool and a CRM solution as well, there are a lot more technology solutions on the market as well, but how, what you think, what role does the technology, especially after all these COVID and, and, and pandemic situation, uh, play in, in place to ensure the smooth operation and consistency in franchise across the board? Well, I think understanding how franchise all companies operate and um, and all the things that need to be controlled and monitored um, in a franchise operation from, from a franchisor's perspective, a franchise management system that is able to accommodate all those aspects, everything from marketing to customer relationship management um, to project management in certain cases to uh, training systems and, and learner management systems. There's a number of aspects that will in, that will be involved in any franchise or company and for a franchise or to have all of that in one place is crucial um, to be able to monitor and manage relationships with their franchisees and the franchisees with with their customers is hugely important um, as i said it's adapting and modeling and blending two different business models um, and yet uh, try and have a system that does that successfully in a tiered system that can be replicated is is also um, not easy to find. So the franchisor's model is, is as I said, very different, as, as we know, to the franchisee's model, and yet you're managing all these franchisees, and you need to have your eye on their key performance indicators as well. So to have that all in one place... Yeah, you need to have a good system that does that. Otherwise, you end up, um, you know, communication is held in people's emails and then somebody leaves and you, you, you haven't got the last remnants of the conversation. Learner management is ha handled on different apps um, and not necessarily in one place. And it all becomes a little bit of a dog's breakfast. Um, and when that starts to happen, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. And uh, t t a system that is in, that is able to to manage and control all of that is absolutely vital. Vital. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, just uh, try to get a couple of like more insights because you got so many brilliant things uh, what you can share with us. So, are there any particular regions and countries that you believe they are emerging and promising destination for franchises when they're choosing? 
You know, I think it's less about countries with opportunity. Yes, certainly the emerging markets always offer opportunity. A slightly higher risk, but generally great opportunity um, in there. Um, however, um, they ch- they can be challenging markets to get into. But if you if you can get into them, you know, volume is massive, and so you if you get if you've got the right system that can work really well. I think it's more sectors that are doing well and that can be applied. So, you know, for example, the health and wellness sector is so massive at the moment, especially since since COVID and 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 all of that. So, it's a it's an industry that spans many many kinds of businesses that, you know, from from the the obvious, you know, um um beauty and and that's that space right through to to sort of almost um uh, like your pharmacy ranges and your and your uh, mass out companies and and things like that it's it's a very broad sector um and there's a lot of opportunity in there um and 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 people are concentrating the effort so the end consumer you know finds that this is an important part of their life that it it was always there before but somehow since covid that's become very much more important i think the focus on children is is massive and again i think covid taught us all to be grateful for what we have around us and sure. um and and looking and looking towards to the future for children um a lot of us feel that in the age of ai um we you know are the school systems able to keep up with that kind of technology do we need to boost that with our children and so that children's education sector is is growing growing massively and there's a lot that they offer that the schooling systems don't so so there's the, that, that that's a, b- a big sector and i think for for a lot of us green energy anything in the green energy sector and green energy moving into the first world spaces is much easier than going into the into the emerging market spaces who are still reliant on things like coal and coal power and and that sort of thing so so but but great opportunity so i think anything in that green energy sector is 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 great and i, I as as that's why i say i think the stalwarts are always going to be retail and food and things like that. We always we always need those. Um, but in terms of op- great opportunity, uh, I, I think health and wellness. I think children's education. I think green energy certainly have 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 great opportunity around them. Uh-huh. Amazing, Belinda. Thank you very much. Well, just to just to closing down this amazing interview, and I'm pretty sure that you will be in this uh, to channel again to share some some knowledge. Uh, what piece of advice would you give for businesses looking to take their franchise in, in, in internationally? Obviously, we did a lot, and you talked a lot, and and uh, I, I really hope people will listen and re-listen this uh, this show because there is a lot to learn from it. But if you if you need to like a summary or or what one big piece of advice, what that would be. It would be to get a properly researched, thought through strategic brand alignment assessment. And if you need help with that, we can help you at Runo. We've we've practically done that many times over, but it's the best piece of advice I could give anybody about going into a new a new space. It does sometimes require some on the ground um uh, research as well as desktop research. Um, but before you go into a market, you know, the big, big brands that we all know, the big food, fast food brands that don't need their names mentioned here, but that, that all come to mind. They all do this. They all, they all invest in this heavily before they appoint anybody in a country. They've done their sums properly. And it's no different for a smaller brand wanting to expand. Um, it's just that the, the cost of not doing this, it's, it's, it, it, it runs into the same sort of figures that the cost of making the wrong decision about a franchisee <laughs> ends up being. So, you know, we, we all feel that pain. You appoint the wrong person and to get rid of that person out of your network, you know, if you just made a different decision earlier on, you'd have saved yourself a lot of pain and a lot of money. And it's the same when it goes into entering a new market. Just do things properly from the start. Do your research, do your homework. And if you're not sure how that should be done, then come and talk to us because we're certainly in a position to help you with that thank you very much first well, the one piece of advice what i can give to everybody is certainly uh, get in contact with with runo franchising because they know what they're doing and if something you can learn from this uh, this interview is that they really got experience on the field so for those who are interested in seeking expertise and guidance from runo franchising how they can get in touch and what would be the the starting process thank you for that um andreas yes uh, 
visit our website, www.runofranchising.co.uk. You can pick up the phone at 015-22246-812 um, or contact me on my email address. I'll be very happy to uh, assist and answer any questions. And I am Belinda, B-E-L-I-N-D-A, at runofranchising.co.uk. That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Belinda, for these amazing uh, insights and the uh, and the interview. Uh, this is the franchise factor, and this was the expert highlight, uh, one of the 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 best and 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 uh, the most successful part of our our show. And I think we got an amazing uh, interview today. And I really hope that Belinda will come back and share more insights. And I know that Runo franchising is the best choice for everybody. Thank you very much for the interview, uh, Belinda, and uh, and uh, thank you to join us today. Thank you, Andres. Thanks for the opportunity and um, and all the best to everyone who is wanting to expand using a franchising model. So welcome back to The Franchise Factor. I hope you enjoyed uh, the wonderful interview, wonderful insight um, into international franchising uh, brought to you by Belinda and obviously wonderfully interviewed by Mr. Andres Tazi. Uh, so we have six minutes left. Listen to me and uh, Andres warbling on today. I guess just in terms of positioning, we've got great hopes for this show, haven't we? Starting, we're, we're going to be doing it fortnightly from now on? Yeah, fortnightly, every two weeks, same time for now. So what sort of topics have we, have the listeners got to look forward to in the future? Well, very interestingly, now that we got more and more people try to get into the show and they want to get some some uh, some interviews and we, we got really brilliant lineups coming up uh, from experts. We're working together with, with companies like the International Franchise uh, Association and we want to do some global work with them. So we will invite international franchise uh, uh, owners and experts as well in the show. Uh, from about 45 countries. So it's going to be absolutely amazing and we can learn a lot from those different franchise businesses, how they're running in their own um, countries. And then obviously there are a lot of things coming up when we want to do some interviews with people who are running the biggest franchise events and franchise shows. Uh, BFA is a big part of, of the franchising in the UK and one of their top goals for, uh, for 2023 and 24 is to get more knowledge to to the people about the franchising market because there are some some really weird situations when for example as you, as i just mentioned uh, earlier about this that story of of how the the um, company tried to get in australia so even in the uk um, and this is what, what probably triggered this whole show and and the way how we want to use this show to get more information to franchise businesses, but for, for regular business owners who want to get into the franchise market as well, and the people of the street, to be honest, is that there was a, there was a, um, a burger uh, place um, up north where someone started a, a campaign against one of the franchise businesses, a choose local, be local, uh, and do local. And then the franchisee owner who owned that place just came out and I'm, I'm live here for 50 years. I'm, I'm, I'm being in the school with you. And people don't understand that the franchise owner is actually a local person. They just choose to have that brand uh, and they just choose to run that local business. And then the, the work, what they're giving, the people who we work there, there will be local people. So they're creating jobs. And it's actually really franchising business is really big uh, for the UK economy as well. So we want to teach people how franchising really works and what it's about. And this is why we have these experts on, on that. But obviously we try to teach and give a lot for, from a marketing and sales perspective and hopefully a lot of insights from you uh, from from the business finance accountancy numbers a lot of things what you oh, actually all the boring, stuff, all right? the bo Thanks, boring and very important things <laughs> no it's, it's interesting um i was just thinking about a point a very interesting point about um so i suppose you know to start off with you'd think uh the franchisee is is not local and as you say you know you could have a situation where a, a, a guy was effectively born in the town whatever and i think a good example um for me, for, for the, the supermarket that I most respect, might surprise you, is Aldi. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you why, for several reasons. Um, on a on an operational level, the quality of the of the checkout operators is massively better than anywhere else. It always makes me laugh. Um, go to Marks and Spencer's, for instance, you know, where you're paying... 
in some cases, twice as much twice for the same much. product. Mm. All right? And you tend to, no disrespect, because they're nice ladies, uh, the typical Marks and Spencers employee tends to be a lady, maybe even as old as 70, but, you know, 65, who likes to chat. Mm. And getting it probably from the time you put your shopping out on the, the thing to going, it, it takes several minutes. Aldi, on the other hand, uh, you could put twice as much down and, and, and it's like boom, 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 boom. But also it's quite pleasant. It's still pleasant, But yeah. the, thing, the thing that I think is notable about Aldi is, is Aldi is obviously not a British company, but um, Aldi sell local produce. That's so if you walk absolutely in, right. If you walk in Aldi, you know, you get the best British steak, the best British mints. So Meat, they're egg. a very good example of a, a global business that can go local. Absolutely right. And they're treating their stuff really well and the system is really, really on place. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so, I was just thinking I know, that maybe the, um, the franchise business uh, needed us to help them with their marketing because there's some very obvious marketing slogans you could run if you were that guy. <laughs> Well, we're running a lot of marketing for franchise businesses, and I really love those campaigns. It's really interesting how how you. I think that the the most interesting aspect of uh, the franchise market is how it's built it up for from very different level of business owners and people of all types. So the franchisees um, are are from so many different. Uh, um, type of people okay so i hope you enjoyed uh the latest installment of the franchise factor um it's been a break for me we've not done a show for maybe six weeks i think so um very keen to get things back on track we've got very high hopes for the show in the future and where it's going to go thank you so much for listening to us today i am paul wait and he is andras tashi and we'll be back in two weeks time have a lovely time take care of yourselves